I call the Agriculture Finance and Policy Committee meeting to order. Today is March 23rd, 2023. There is a quorum present and uh, may have a motion from someone to approve the minutes from our previous meeting. I so move. Representative Nelson moves the minutes from March 21st, 2023. Any discussion? March 21st. Uh, any comments to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. And the motion passes. The minutes from our last meeting are approved. We are going to go in a little bit of a different order because uh, testifier is having difficulty making their way to us. So we are going to begin uh, with Representative Vang. Would you care to move uh, the first bill you'd like us to hear today? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we can start off with um, the hemp fiber processing bill, uh, House File 2773. Okay, so Representative Vang moves House File 2773 before the committee. Uh, the bill is before us. Representative Vang, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so House File 2773 is a bill trying to revitalize a once a robust hemp economy in Minnesota. Uh, when hemp was legalized in 2018 by the Farm Bill, the industry for hemp on CBD took off, uh, but it has now leveled. Uh, there is great potential for hemp fiber and grain, and this bill focuses on addressing a barrier towards jumpstarting the industry. Uh, there are many uses for hemp fiber that can range from clothing, building materials, paper, industrial textiles like rope and carpet. I've also heard from uh, communities and advocates wanting to get into the hemp fiber industry, but there are not enough processors. Some are even processing out of state. So this bill will be a grant opportunity to attract hemp processors. The state will support up to 200,000 uh, dollars requiring match funding of at least 25% of the grant received. And this is based off on Missouri's hemp fiber processing program. There's also one-time funding in agreed for hemp research of uh, $500,000. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I can be open for any questions. Excellent. Uh, do we have any testifiers that we are aware of um, to testify for against this bill? Anyone from the audience wish to testify on House File 2773? Seeing none, we will move to member discussion. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair, I think this is a good bill. The idea is there we need more processing for, for hemp to grow the industry. Just wondering about the language, at least in the, um, the bill summary. The uh, money would go to hemp processors to purchase processing equipment. Mm -hmm. Now, I read that to mean they already have some equipment. <coughs> would this be used to pay off an existing loan or just for new equipment for these processors? Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Anderson. I think it could be for both. I understand that equipment is, can be very uh, expensive. So I believe it can be open to both, and, and I can let... Um, the department decide on how to best proceed, whether it can be to pay back a loan or to um, purchase new equipment. Any other questions or discussion to the bill? Seeing none, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, like I said, hemp is a versatile crop that is a win-win for farmers and the environment. I believe in the potential of hemp to be the next big thing for Minnesota. Minnesota has further ground to do a lot of great things with hemp, from helping to address climate change to bringing economic development to communities across the state. Uh, there is a strong long-term potential in hemp fiber, and I think it will be a good investment for the state to partake. And I thank the committee for their support, and I renew my motion for, to, for House File 27. 73 to be laid over possible inclusion. Thank you. Representative Ren Vang renews her motion, and uh, the bill is laid over. Uh, let's see. Representative Vang, which of the sundry of bills would you like us to have before us next? Yeah, we can start uh, the next hemp bill uh, that's complementary to this bill, House File 2946. Thank you, Madam Chair. So House file 2946 is before the committee. And uh, thank you. Please 
uh, proceed and explain the bill. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this bill is complementary to the hemp fiber processing bill we just talked about. Uh, it makes current improvements to the uh, industrial hemp program that we have here at the department. Uh, I believe I also have a testifier here today who could help walk through the bill and explain its changes. Excellent. Um, will the testifier please approach the stand, identify yourself before the committee, and proceed with your testimony, please. Madam Chair, members, my name is Anthony Cordelat. I supervise the industrial hemp program for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, I want to thank uh, Representative Vang for bringing this forward. This bill essentially does three things, um, and, and all of them essentially bring our Chapter 18K, the industrial hemp uh, statutes, into line with the federal law. A lot of you know that in uh, we've had two farm bills that have uh, set hemp production forward over the last six or seven years, and that's caused a lot of changes, especially since we established the Industrial Hemp Act in 2015. Um, so the first thing that this bill does is it fixes a, an issue with licensing that we have after the 2018 Farm Bill passed and nationalized hemp across the United States. It states that anyone growing uh, cannabis for the intent to grow hemp has to have a license, either through the state or tribal authority if they have a state approved plan like Minnesota does with USDA or through the USDA. Um, so it removes the commercial, uh, the word commercial in front of uh, processing and production. And that's important because we have had issues uh, when we partner with our law enforcement uh, entities out there that have ran into issues with people saying, hey, it's okay, I don't need to be licensed, this is hemp and it's for my personal use. Uh, the second thing it would do is bring into line the issue with background checks. Um, right now, state law requires only that uh, first-time applicants to get a hemp license uh, get background check. The federal law changed that in 2018, stating that anyone that is an authorized representative on a license, so somebody partnering with the licensee, also has to submit a background check. So that would uh, bring us in line there. Then the third thing, which is a little more complicated, is rulemaking. And I'll give you the short story, and if you have any questions, um, fire away. But essentially, we have rules in place, uh, Minnesota Rules 1565 for hemp production. We had to put those in place due to the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill and then USDA taking over and publishing their own rules. Um, we did it under the good cause exemption. And because of that, it only allows our, our rules to be active for two years. What we're essentially asking for is to complete the process now and take our established rules through the full rulemaking process. And it extends it, I believe, until uh, 2025. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, any other folks who would like to testify for or against House File 2946? Seeing none, uh, we will move to member discussion and questions. Lead Anderson. Thank you again, Madam Chair. <clears throat> to the testifier, I think the last time you were here, you were testifying on the uh, legalized marijuana bill, and we had a lot of, maybe you weren't here, I don't know, but anyway, we had a, several hemp farmers testify that they were very concerned about being thrown in with uh, that, that group. Now, I don't know if your bill today has anything to do with that, but has that been separated out? Uh, can these farmers now use depreciation schedules? How is that working out with the hemp producers? Uh, Representative Vang, or shall I direct to the testifier? Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the, the adult use bill going through uses a lot of terms that are confusing. It's, causing, it's calling uh, adult use cannabis, which hemp and marijuana both are. It's all the same plant. So a lot of our hemp growers are concerned about that. However, this bill specifically only deals with the hemp production under federal law. So essentially, um, it wouldn't change how they grow or uh, how they process raw hemp. That's under federal law and can't be changed right now. Thank you, Mr. Cordelet. Follow up, Lead Anderson. So again, to the test, are you concerned um, as that bill moves along, it's not being addressed or are they, are they working on it? 
Mr. Cordelet. Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, yes. I, the, I believe the last big rewrite they had that just went through um, is now trying to separate out hemp from whatever adult use becomes. Any other questions? Discussion to the bill, Representative Cha. I don't know if it's to the bill, but I guess it's in regards to uh, THC and hemp derived from um, hemp versus uh, marijuana. Is there a way to, um, I guess, identify the CBD or the THC, whether what plant family it came from? Just Mr. Cordelet? Madam Chair, Representative Chott, um, no, there isn't. Uh, THC is THC. It's a chemical compound, and that is one thing that is uh, probably the most misunderstood amongst all of this talk of if it's hemp-derived or if it's, if it's non-hemp-derived. All a hemp plant is is a, can is a cannabis plant that includes marijuana that produces a lower amount of THC overall. So you can't tell the difference between the extract. Representative Chott. Right, so now that's good information. So then somebody could import THC from a different state and claim it's hemp and still be legal. Mr. Cordelet? Madam Chair, Representative, yes, that would be illegal uh, because it's coming uh, under federal law. It is not legal, so that would be violations of interstate, uh, interstate transport and the Controlled Substance Act, of the Federal Controlled Substance Act. Representative Chow. Thank you very much. Other Questions or discussion to the bill? Seeing none, Representative Vang, closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee, for the time. And this is a good bill. And, and thank you to uh, my testifier, Tony, for being here today to help answer questions. And uh, with that, uh, I renew my motion for this bill to be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Vang renews her motion for House File 2946 to be laid over for possible inclusion. And it, the bill is laid over. Uh, Representative Vang, which bill would you like to move before us? Uh, we can do the dairy program, House File 2861. Representative Vang moves House File 2861 before the committee. And the bill is before us. Representative Vang, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 2861. Uh, is, is uh, a bill, it's not a new bill, in 2019 during uh, the falling uh, milk prices and collapsing of dairy barns due to heavy snow, the Minnesota legislature passed a public-private partnership called the Dairy, Dairy with an Eye to Assist with Family Dairy Farms. Uh, the concept is simple, a federal risk management program already exists called the Dairy Margin Coverage, coverage Program to mitigate the risk in of, of to mitigate the risk in those months where feed and other costs overcome milk price. Uh, dairy farmers uh, committed signing up to up to five-year federal milk insurance program and the Minnesota Dairy Grant Program provided Minnesota dairy operators a rebate on some of their premiums. It's not a given dairy farmers will sign up for the five-year DMC option and the Minnesota Dairy Grant Program offers a meaningful incentive to do so. Uh, we are targeting this incentive to family dairy farms but only if they invest their own money in the five-year federal insurance program. Uh, the program worked just as it was intended in 2019. Over the course of the federal DMC participation from 2019 to 2022, uh, increased from 82%, 71%, 83%, and 87% of Minnesota dairies signed up for the federal DMC program uh, versus only 75%, 46%, 71%, and 73% of dairies nationwide. Uh, th that's really a, a nearly 15% Minnesota advantage. Uh, we will be better off as a state with more Minnesota dairy farmers in, in this federal milk insurance program. Um, and this uh, dairy program, dairy with an eye, is the way to do it. And so far, the investment resulted in $178 million in USDA DMC payouts to Minnesota participants, $52 million more than if Minnesota participation in DMC was at the lower national average rate. Uh, we can support Minnesota dairy farmers with uh, this dairy program. It worked before, and we can help sustain and stabilize Minnesota's hardworking dairy farmers for the next five years by doing it again. And with that, I'll yield my time to my testifier. Thank you very much. Your first testifier, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members. Uh, thank you, Representative Bang. My name, for the record, is Lucas Shellstrom. I serve as Executive Director of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association. I'm also a dairy farmer and cheese plant owner from Bruton, Minnesota. 
Uh, my testimony is going to be short because I know we have two more, and I know we talked about this at Dairy Day at the Capitol and had further opportunity to talk about this in many of your offices. Uh, my testimony surrounds the question I get most often. Uh, I haven't gotten for the past two years because we've had uh, uh, good dairy prices for about two years, but I think maybe next month I'll start getting again. What can we do for Minnesota dairy farmers? This is it. Uh, we did it in 2019. It worked as designed. It worked a little too well uh, in the sense that it'd be really nice if this program did not need to work at all. This is federal insurance. Uh, dairy farmers are not used to signing up for a margin insurance program. This was new in 2014. It rolled out poorly. And so we had the second, second chance at it in 2019. Uh, Minnesota, as you heard, those numbers signed up at above 75 and closer to 80% most years. Uh, our neighbors, like Wisconsin and other states around the country, uh, signed up at about 50 to 60%. That was a huge difference in Minnesota dairy farms either surviving or having a peaceful uh, way to transition their farm to the next generation or whatever they did next. And uh, there's nothing we could think of, there's nothing we could, we could search for than finding this small match of state funds with dairy farmers' own dollars and federal funds to, I think, ensure, literally I-N-S-U-R-E, ensure their success for the next five years when this farm bill is renewed. So I'm happy to take any questions, but I know we have, uh, I think, two other testifiers. Thank you for, very much for your time. Thank you for putting this forward, uh, Representative Vang, and thank you, Chair and Committee members. Thank you, Mr. Shostrom. Always love to hear when we best Wisconsin in something. So um, we will move on to our next testifier, who I believe is on Zoom, on remote. If you could identify yourself before the committee and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Thank you Chair Purcell and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Uni Beal, and my husband and I farm with our son and his family in Fillmore County, Minnesota. We own and operate 200 cow dairy. We raise all of our replacement heifers, and we feed out and market our Holstein steers. We also raise all of our feed, and we market some corn and soybeans as well. I'm also proud to serve as the Fillmore County President of Minnesota Farmers Union. On behalf of myself and MFU, I'm glad to share my strong support for Chair Vang's HF 2861 to reestablish the Dairy Assistant Investment and Relief Initiative. The futures for the milk price are coming down. Our last milk check was the lowest we have had in three years. In 2019, when this program was first established, we got an incentive from the state and it helped to pay our bills. But since then, input prices have gone way up. Feed rations, have they can't be cheapened. You can't scrimp on the care for our cows. Uh, we have our hoof trimmers, we have to use, we have to pay them and it needs to be done and our vet, vet prices. We also, um, our milk, Milk, bulk milk prices have doubled to pick up our milk. And, it's, and of course they've, they've doubled because there aren't as many dairy farmers in our county, in our area, and like neighbors have gone out of business. So the trucks have to drive further to get to our place. And um, so, and all the contractors, whoever pumps our manure pit and um, other contracts we've hired, they're all their their costs are much higher than they were several years ago. This would be a very meaningful program to help programs remain solvent. There's no secret that this is a challenging economy and anything the state can do to assist small dairy farmers is a family dairies is a win. We're required to pay our bills every month and this would help. Thank you for the opportunity to share, to share my thoughts today. Thank you, Ms. Beal. Our next testifier is in person, Mr. Pagel. Please come on up and introduce yourself before the committee and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jeff Pagel. I'm a third generation dairy farmer from Iota. I'm here today representing Minnesota Farm Bureau and the District 1, which is Southeast Minnesota. I testify today in support of House File 2061, a bill to appropriate new funds <clears throat> to the dairy assistance 
Investment Relief Investment, also known as the Dairy with an I. I can speak to the merits of this program. <clears throat> My family and I have used or utilized the first version of this program in the past, which was created in 2019. <clears throat> the dairy program helps to incentivize and enhance the usage of the dairy margin coverage program created at the fe federal level, leading to more farmers having protection in the event of low milk prices. As many on the committee know, milk price is not tied to feed prices, and when margins between those two commodities narrow, dairy farmers need assistance to help weather the storm. We're thankful for the work of Chair Vang to see this program be reappointed for the future and look forward to continuing our work with her and other legislative partners to see this program be continued. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, Mr. Pagel. Are there any other folks who wish to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, we will move to member discussion and questions. <clears throat> Representative Cha. Thank you, Chair Purcell. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Vang and uh, the authors of this bill, like Representative Wogelmont for protecting the dairy industry, you know, and extending the uh, sunset on this program to 2026. I think that, um, you know, dairy farms are important to Minnesota, and I'm glad that uh, you are chief author in this uh, bill for it. Thank you. Representative Reen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair Vang, for bringing this forward. Um, as someone who's lived in Carver County uh, for the past 25 years, I've heard about the dairy farms, and I know we've, um, you know, we've lost a lot of dairy farmers in our state and in our county. Um, very supportive of this program, and thank you for bringing it forward. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I think the coming at least few months, maybe year or so, um, it's going to be real tight in terms of dairy margins. So, yeah, support the program. Chair Vang, I just have to ask you a question, though. Um, we passed this bill back in 2019, and uh, we're able to secure $3 million from the Jobs Committee. And in light of the uh, rather slim target this committee received uh, this year, um, is there any chance of getting some additional funding from uh, another another committee here uh, in the House. Representative Bang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Anderson, for the question. Uh, yes, um, I am always looking. If we can find additional funds, I'm always looking for that. Any other discussion or questions to the bill? Representative Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative or Chair Vang. Thank you for this bill. I think it's uh, you know, it is something important as the, we've heard from the other testifiers. Um, you know, I had uh, the 2014 farm bill. Um, I'd signed up for the dairy protection under that. And as uh, I think it was uh, Lucas Schostrom had said, it was kind of a, poor, it was uh, rolled out poorly and it really didn't do what it was designed to. But uh, fortunately I sold my dairy cows before I had to have the 2019 pro, uh, the protections that were afforded later. So. Uh, but it, you know, it's done much better, and I think you know, with the state match, I think it has been a, a good thing overall. And uh, you know, I, I would echo what Representative Hans or Anderson said um, about you know trying to steal from another committee's targets. So, always Representative a pleasure. Bang, would you like to respond? <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Uh, you and I think alike. Always a pleasure <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Any other discussion to the bill? Closing remarks, Representative Vang. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think uh, my testifier said it best. This is a good bill, uh, and I look forward to uh, moving this forward. With that, I renew my motion for House File 2861 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Vang renews her motion to lay over House File 2861 for possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. And our final bill from Representative Vang, I believe. Would you like to move House File 1587 before the committee? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move House File 1587 as amended uh, to the, before the committee. All right, thank you, Representative Vang. Uh, we have House File 1587 before the committee. Uh, would you like to uh, introduce your bill? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, we've already did the walkthrough earlier this week, um, and uh, I don't believe there are any amendments. So I believe this is probably my first time using this line. It seems to be there's peace in the valley. Uh, so <laughs> I'm uh, happy to, uh, and I look forward to uh, 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 get the committee support. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right. Uh, I don't believe we have any testifiers. Are there any testifiers for this bill? Any folks in the committee in the room wish to testify? I think we will then just move to member discussion to the bill as amended, 1587. Lee Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I don't mean to append our piece in the valley. Just uh, uh, on page 23 again, I'm just going to go back. We talked in committee last time about a possible uh, change or agreement on the uh, nursery stock testing. Um, has that been arrived at? Um, yes. To, ch to chair, to the chair. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, there was an amendment that I, I worked out language with the Department of Agriculture and missed the deadline, as is apparently my move in this committee. So apologies. Um, there. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I emailed it to you. I'm happy to send it to the rest of the committee as well. Um, in that bill, specifically, we talked about detectable levels of neonicotin neonicotinoids, and I worked with the Department of Agriculture to figure out, um, to actually put a number on that so that we wouldn't have to just rely on how old or new the equipment is if we could detect something. Um, so it's basically looking at what the EPA levels are and if there's not an EPA level um, using a different kind of standard. And I apologize, I don't have that language in front of me. But um, the I worked with the department and we seem copacetic with that and I'm happy to share that with other folks. And I apologize, I did not get it in in time. Additional follow-up, Lee Anderson? No. Thank you for following the thread with that. Other discussion or questions to the bill? Seeing none, uh, Representative Vang, closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and the committee uh, for uh, the discussion, and uh, I will just keep it short uh, as we're going on a really great pace here. Uh, and so I will renew my motion to uh, re-refer House File 1587 as amended to the General Register. Uh, Representative Vang renews her motion for House File 1587 to, as amended to be moved to the General Register. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Anderson. Madam Chair, so then just to clarify, you will have the amendment on, on the House floor to make that correction then? Thank you. I believe that is uh, where I need to insert it at this point. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to move this to the General Register, please say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion carries, and House File 1587 is moved to the General Register, and we will do a little musical chairs here for a moment, and Chair Vang will get her seat back. Thank you. Um, and I can call up my testifiers to join me up here if you all would like. All right, members, this is probably our fastest committee hearing. <laughs> uh, next, last bill on the agenda is House File 2784, uh, Representative Sensamera. Uh, yes, you, thank you. Um, and Madam Chair, committee members, I do have an author's amendment, A1. All right. Uh, to the A1, would you like to please explain? Yes, um, the A1 amendment gets the bill in the shape that I would like and matches it up with um, the Senate language. Um, it just gives some clarification um, about how the funds will be used, um, uh, kind of a little bit more differentiation about administrative costs um, versus problematic costs. Um, and so I hope people can support the A1 amendment. All right, discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1 say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 
The motion prevails. The A1 is adopted. Uh, to the bill as amended, Representative uh, Sansamira. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Vang, committee members. Um, I'm happy to be here today talking about House File 2784. This bill would provide a grant through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to the Women's Environmental Institute to develop a farming incubator project for aspiring black, indigenous, and people of color farmers at the WEI farm. It's increasingly recognized that there is a growing need to provide opportunities for the many small-scale emerging BIPOC farmers in Minnesota, some of whom are new American immigrants from traditional farming backgrounds, others who are culturally diverse young people wanting to go into farming. There are also many barriers for these emerging small-scale BIPOC farmers, including affordable access to land, equipment, and financing. This project will join several others working to open the doors to this opportunity and to help keep farming strong and equitable in Minnesota. With farming incubator programs, a land-owning entity provides low-cost land, use of equipment, and technical assistance to cohorts of farmers, providing them with skills, experience, and business connections to use in assessing their farming future and pursuing financing. Access to affordable, high-quality, nutritious food is becoming more and more critical as food prices rise and hunger increases in low-income and working-class communities, specifically for children and elders. WEI has experience working with aspiring bar BIPOC farmers to fill that need, and they need financial assistance to maintain and expand that work. For this specific project, WEI will work with SAFI, the Somali American Farming Institute, to develop the project. Um, today, we will hear, get a chance to hear from SAFI staff, as well as several other BIPOC communities who know and have worked with WEI in the past or aspire to in the future. Um, and I would now like to yield the rest of my time to my testifiers. All right. Our first testifier is Karen Clark from Women's Environmental Institute. If you can please identify yourself before the committee proceed. Always good to see you, uh, mm -hmm. former representative Karen Clark. Thank you, Chair Vang, um, and thank you, Representative Sensenmaier, for this opportunity. It's been, uh, I think, about four years since I've been in this room um, in an agriculture committee, and I, I think with Representative Anderson and others, and, and so it's, it's good to be back. Uh, I see a few, few uh, former colleagues and also many new uh, representatives, so it's an honor to be here, and I thank you for this opportunity. Um, as was mentioned, the bill that's before you uh, would provide uh, funding to help the Women's Environmental Institute uh, carry forward and actually develop in a more formal way what we've been doing for a number of years, which is providing opportunities for especially BIPOC farmers and Native American farmers to come to the Women's Environmental Institute and, and have some, a learning opportunity to uh, grow some of their own vegetables or other products that they want to grow, sometimes for their family. And one of our, our goals is really to help those individuals be able to um, spin off on their own in the future and have their own land. And that's exactly why this bill is before you today. Uh, we were approached to ask to develop some more uh, opportunities for some additional farmers. And uh, one of, you're gonna hear from Safi who is bringing forward some of the folks that want to uh, come, come out to the Women's Environmental Institute farmland. It's organically certified and it's, um, it's about an hour's drive from here. You're, you'd all be welcome to come and visit sometime. We have a number of community events, and um, we, we are really an educational institution. We spend a lot of time developing classes and trainings, hands-on tra hands trainings for people who want to learn to farm, as well as growing our own uh, produce for sale. We, um, we sell our products at the farmer's market. We have a number of veggie RX uh, clinics that we serve in the area, and we've helped develop um, a regional um, hub, I guess you'd say, for some of the farmers around the North Branch, Sasago County area, uh, who are now able to do farming and sell some of their products online. So we're, we're an organization that does a lot of um, advocacy to help people get into farming and to learn the, the ways to grow organically, and we're, we're very committed to this project. We just need a little help to expand our facilities right now because when we bring in additional farmers, we need to make sure that we have adequate uh, processing equipment and so on available. And right now, uh, this funding would help us get a start on um, providing some of that additional infrastructure. Everything from uh, the actual processing to you know the, the lay flat for the irrigation, all of those kinds of things. 
So I'll be glad to answer any questions. I think um, we have a, another witness right now who can speak to you, and maybe we could do that together. All right, next testifier is Farhido Kali from uh, Somal Somalia American Farming Institute. If you can please identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Farhio Khalif, and I am with Somali American Farmers Institute, and I'm an immigrant farmer here in the state of Minnesota. And past 10 years, uh, since 2012, I had the opportunity to volunteer and take classes and uh, advocate in Women Environmental Institute. That's firsthand as someone who grew up farming in back home in Africa, in East Africa, where my father owns a farm and my uncles. And my uncle continues farming here in the state of Minnesota. He, he's based in farming in Hutchinson, Minnesota. Um, but he doesn't have the capacity to do a lot of the work and, and support that. He, uh, WEI does for the, a lot of the immigrant, indigenous, and Piper communities. Um, so this, uh, uh, this house um, uh, files 2784 will help a lot of uh, immigrant farmers, not only Safi. Uh, people that I know that uh, based on and uh, fair bold and register in St. Cloud and Minneapolis to a different part of the state and um, will come forward. And I'm also a member of African Immigrant Farmers Alliance, where we, about over 50 farmers, are coming together every Sunday night, and they all are African farmers. But also we grow in as a pie park. They are members of the Latino among, among communities and native communities. We're coming together to talk about the lack of opportunity when it comes to farming is very hard work, very, very hard work. When we go out there, we don't have a land access and things that uh, a lot of, of um, emerging immigrant farmers are looking for. This, um, this bill will give opportunity to not only Safi, but a lot of immigrant farmers who will come to WEI and WEI will provide us a space next few years, hopefully next four or five years where we can continue and, and each one of can get a quarter acre and that incubator where you can farm and you can grow to that for the next four to five years and then learn from that. So I'm asking for your support today and this is just something that a lot of immigrants will come forward any day will testify when they don't have the opportunity and the support. But this will help us to get there. And I will um, hope that to get all your support on House File 2784. Thank you. All right, thank you, Farheel. Uh, I believe our next testifier is Jovita Francisco Morales, if she's here today. Madam Chair, if, no. I, I, um, I don't see her, and I did get a note that she was having trouble um, getting here, so I, I think maybe she, we should just pass. I believe she may have sent a letter. Okay. I, and, yeah, so, I believe she might have submitted a letter, and okay. probably has been posted on the committee page. Uh, that is all for testifiers. Do we have any from the public that would like to testify for and against this bill? Seeing none, discussion to the bill. Representative Cha. Sorry, I beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chair Vang, and thank you for your testifiers. I just want to share a story with you. Yes. Um, I'm Hmong, and I'm from Asia. We're the indigenous people of Asia, and my parents and my ancestors have been farming for thousands of years, right? Mm -hmm. That's all we do. My uh, relatives back in Southeast Asia are still farming and are cattle farmers, right? And so when you talk about, you know, being, you know, farmers back in your homeland and stuff like that, I can totally relate with you with that. And um, I know my dad does all the plowing, but my mom does really all the farming, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to support this. And uh, thank you to uh, former Representative uh, Clark for coming by my office and looking at my farmer's market uh, <laughs> sign outside my office and having that conversation with me, you know? Um, you know, uh, continue to champion women in all spaces and, uh, you know, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good to see you, Representative Clark. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the bill author. Um, it, it seems that we're kind of developing a, a pattern in this committee of making grants, and it used to be we'd go through the Department of Agriculture to, to distribute those grants, and now we seem to be steering those grants to a, like a third party, another, another group. And I'm just wondering why we wouldn't go through the MDA, who has a lot of experience in uh, dealing with grants, and, and instead of using a, a third party, set another group to, to distribute this money. 
Representative Sensor. Yeah. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Lee Anderson, for that question. Um, just, you know, a couple clarifying points. So um, this bill would, you know, go through the, um, you know, Commissioner of Agriculture, um, but then it would be giving funds to the Women's Environmental Institute to then, you know, distribute to these aspiring farmers. Um, you know, I think the reason for kind of, you know, having um, the funds going directly to this group uh, rather than directly to the farmers is the relationships that WEI has built with different, um, you know, organizations representing different farmers of color and indigenous farmers. You know, the with two letters of support are included here. We have a testifier from one of the groups. Um, and so I think that, you know, we find that sometimes, especially for these smaller nonprofit organizations, they find it easier to, you know, kind of build a relationship, work with an established nonprofit that can then help connect them to resources through the state that they might not be able to access on their own. So I think it's really about the track record of work that WEI has and the relationships that they've built with these organizations that can help organizations who might not know how to kind of navigate the state funding um, get these critical funds to do this work. And I don't know if my testifier wants to add anything. Thank you, uh, Karen Clark. Thank you. That's correct. And then, then also, um, Representative Anderson, Anderson, if you look at the bill, some of the bill will help the organization ourselves to uh, formalize some of the in infrastructure that needs to be, expand a bit in order to take on more uh, farmers right on the land. Representative, so, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in reading through a part of the summary here, uh, there's a list of, of things that these grants would cover um, land, seed, irrigation, supplies, marketing, travel, and child care. And I thought there really aren't a whole lot more expenses that a farmer would have in, in raising the crop. So basically, are we going to be providing everything to, to grow these crops with no expense for the farmer, and yet then anything they produce is going to be pure profit. I mean, that's not really how farming works in the real world. So explain how we're going to be providing all these things, you know, with a grant to the farmers. Karen Clark, Representative Sensenberry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Well, you know, I grew up on a farm and I know there's a lot of work and labor that is, uh, that goes into farming. And so that's exactly what the farmers will be contributing. Their time, their labor, their energy, um, and I have to say, we always learn from our farmers as well as teach. Uh, as uh, Representative Cha was explaining earlier, a lot of the folks who come to us, some of them have traditional farming backgrounds, and I always learn something new about a particular crop or, or, or plant or so on. But the main thing that they would be contributing is their labor. They're, that's not being paid. That's We're just helping them have the resources that are usually the barriers, the land, you know, the equipment, the classes that will help help them learn how to do certain things that they need to know. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I think I heard one of the testifiers say that, uh, is this going to be indoor farming, and is it, is it organic produce they're producing? Or, uh, Karen Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Anderson, the, almost all of this farming will be um, outdoors, but we do have the opportunity to provide some high tunnel uh, growing opportunities for some of our farmers. And I have to tell you, the, if um, our friend, uh, a Latina friend, Jovita, had been here, she would have talked to us about how um, the crop that we were helping her grow, she was actually trying to grow organic peanuts, which is not a common product in Minnesota. It would have been kind of a um, specialty market. Um, in the end, we had trouble with frost. And if, and if she had been able to have um, more time into the um, high tunnel, you know, from the beginning of her planting, it would have she would have had a great crop. They were very healthy plants. But the frost outside is sometimes a barrier. Um, we also do, do one um, crop inside, and that's aquaponics. And that's a closed aquaponic system uh, with growing uh, yellow perch. And we teach people that if they're interested. Some people are, and some people are not. Um, most of the crops, is, as was, as was uh, mentioned by Farheel Khalif, is it's going to be outside. Representative Anderson. Yeah. Well, one last question. Looking at your annual report, um, yeah. you do some work with the, the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute. Can you tell us uh, what kind of things you work together with them on? Karen Clark. Sure. 
That's my neighborhood, Representative Anderson, as you remember. And I think I actually took you over there on a tour once. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we've worked with them on um, some of the advocacy that they ha have wanted to know about farming, um, you know, technical, uh, technical information and assistance. That's mostly, mostly been our role. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, closing remarks, Representative Sinsamara. Um, thank you for the discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. And thank you, uh, Representative Clark and Berheel, for um, coming to speak to us about this important project. Um, you know, I, and just talking to um, farmers as being part of this committee, you know, here again and again about the barriers of acquiring land. And I know that this committee is doing important work to try to ensure that more people that have traditionally faced barriers to, to um, getting land are able to acquire it. But I think in the meantime, especially for people that are starting out, out. Um, uh, a farming incubator project working with an established farm um, that can support you with land, support you with equipment, um, support you with guidance is a great way to do that work. Um, and so I hope uh, that this is a bill that the committee can consider for possible inclusion in the omnibus. Thank you. All right, Representative Sensimera renews her motion. House file 2784 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. With that, Thank members, uh, that is all that we have for today's committee. Our next meeting is Tuesday, March 28th, um, the same time. Um, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Could you kind of walk Can us through the path for next week and getting that bill? Yes. Uh, and it's, Amanda, you can correct me if, if I uh, misspoke. Uh, so for next week, we'll be talking about the finance omnibus bill. I believe we'll do postage on Monday. And then uh, amendments will be due Wednesday at noon. Uh, and then hoping for passage Thursday. A walk through. Yes. Oh, sorry. So Monday postage, Tuesday's committee will be walk through and uh, uh, discussion of the bill and testimony um, of the finance omnibus bill. Wednesday amendments will be due. And then Thursday, hopefully passage. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. So just to clarify, not 9 o'clock in the morning, but noon amendments due on, on Wednesday, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. <laughs> Further, Representative Sensamira. And we do not have committee tomorrow, or do we? Uh, since we did pass uh, the policy omnibus uh, today, then t tomorrow, Friday, is a free day for the committee. So. Any further questions? Oh, and if uh, would, would somebody in the student group would like to introduce themselves, we have a very big audience today. Is there a representative? All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today. Welcome to the Agriculture Finance Committee. You came on a good day. However, we're just finishing up. So thank you. And with that, members, our next meeting is Tuesday, March 28, 2023. This meeting is adjourned.